Hi, in this module, I'm going to briefly introduce the idea of differentiable programming. And differential programming kind of just runs off with ideas of computation graphs and backpropagation that we develop for simple neural networks. Um, there's really enough to say here to fill up an entire course at least. So I'm gonna keep, try to keep things pretty high level, but I will try to highlight the power of composition. So differential programming is closely related to deep learning. I've adopted the former term as an attempt to be more precise in terms of highlighting the mechanics of writing models as you would code. So if you look around at deep learning today, there's some pretty complex models which have many layers, potential mechanisms, residual connections, um, to name a few. And this could be quite overwhelming at first glance. Uh, but when you look closer, you'll notice that these complex models are actually composed of functions. And these functions themselves are composed of smaller functions. So this is the programming part of differential programming, which allows you to build up increasingly more sophisticated model uh, without losing track of what's going on. So let's begin with our familiar example, the three-layer neural network. So remember that in three-layer neural network, we start with our feature vector. In this case, it's a six-dimensional vector. And we left multiply by a matrix. Um, I've drawn some lines here to help us interpret this matrix as a set of rows. So each row corresponds to a hidden unit. And I'm going to take the dot product of each row with uh, the input vector to produce a hidden vector of uh, dimension 4. I'm going to add a bias term. And then I'm going to apply an activation function element-wise, uh, for example, the ReLU or the logistic. Um, now I have um, a vector. And now I can do the same thing again. I apply uh, a matrix, add a bias term, uh, apply an activation function, apply a matrix, which happens to be a vector. I, so I get a scalar, and I add a simple scalar bias term. And I get a score, which then I can happily drive regression or take the sign to drive classification. So what I want to do now is to factor out this kind of complex looking expression into a reusable component, which I'm going to call feed forward. But we're going to see a lot of these uh, box diagrams, which are going to represent functions that we can reuse and have a nice interpretation. So the feed forward function takes in an input vector x and produces another uh, an output vector, which could be of a different dimensionality. And the way to interpret what feed forward we're doing is performing one step of processing. In particular, what that processing is, is uh, taking this input vector, uh, multiplying by a matrix, adding a bias term, and applying an activation function. Okay, So this is a, a function or a program. But unlike normal programming, it's underspecified because the red uh, numbers here are parameters which are private to this function, which are going to be set uh, and tuned later via backpropagation. So now we can write our three-layer neural network using feedforward. And the way I'm going to do this is score is equal to um, you take um, x, or this should be phi of x, um, and you apply phi forward, phi forward, phi forward, and you can write this as phi forward uh, cubed to, as, to be more compact. So this is a very compact way of writing something that would otherwise be uh, quite complicated. So now let's suppose we want to do image classification. Um, we need some way of representing images. So the feed forward function that we just introduced takes a vector as input. So, and we can represent an image as a long vector by, uh, for example, adding all the rows. But then we would have this huge matrix that we would need to be able to transform this vector, resulting in a lot of parameters, and uh, which may make it difficult. Um, and the, the problem here is that we're not really using uh, the spatial structure of images. 
for example, if I just permuted all of the, um, the elements of this vector and retrain, I would basically get this, uh, I would get the identical model. So it's kind of not paying attention to which um, pixels are close by. To fix this uh, problem, uh, we introduce convolutional neural networks, which is a refinement of a fully connected neural network. So here is an example of uh, ConfNet in action. Uh, so here's a car, and you can see that it goes through a number of layers, and over time it computes increasingly abstract representations of the image, and at the end you get a vector representing the probabilities of the different uh, object categories. So uh, if you want to play with ConfNets, um, you can actually click here for Andre Karpathy's um, excellent a demo where you can actually create and train ConfNets in your browser. So another comment is that ConfNets, we're going to introduce them for uh, 2D images, but they can also uh, be applied to uh, text or sequences, which are 1D, or videos, which uh, are... So ConfNets have two basic building blocks. Um, we're not going to go through the details. Um, you can take uh, CS231 if you want to learn all about ConfNets. But instead, I'm going to focus on the interface and show how these, uh, these modules can perform. So the first is uh, Conf. And so Conf takes an image. And the image is going to be represented as a volume, which is a collection of matrices one for each channel, red, green, blue. Each matrix is, has the same dimensionality as the image, uh, height, by width. And uh, what the conf is going to do is it's going to compute another volume of a slightly different size. Usually, the height and width of this volume is going to be equal or maybe slightly smaller than the input volume. And uh, the number of channels is going to be somewhat different. The way that COF is going to compute this volume is via a sequence of filters. And intuitively, what it's going to do is try to detect local patterns with. So here is one filter. And how uh, it works is I'm going to slap the, slide this filter across the image. And uh, if I put the filter here, I'm going to kind of align it up with the, the first uh, kind of pixels on, on the image. Um, I'm going to compute the dot product between the eight numbers here and uh, the um, actually tw sorry, 12 numbers here and the 12 numbers here. I get a single number, which I'm going to write into this entry. I slide the filter over a little bit. I'm going to write into the second entry, and so on. And then for the second filter, I'm going to use to fill up the second output channel. So the number of filters is the number of output channels. OK, so that's all I'm going to say about uh, conf. The second operation is a max pool, which again takes an input volume. And then it produces a smaller um, output volume. It's going to have the same number of channels. And for every slice through the matrix, it's going to um, slide um, a little operate max operation over every two by two or three by three region. So the max over these four numbers is going to be used to fill this uh, um, number and so on. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about uh, max pool. Um, if you want to drill into the details, you can check out this demo or you can uh, learn more in uh, 231. And, um, but Again, I want to highlight that there's these two modules, one for detecting patterns and one for aggregating to kind of reduce the, the dimensionality. And with these uh, two functions, along with feedforward, now we can define AlexNet, which was uh, the seminal CNN from 2012 that won the image competition and really transformed uh, computer. Uh, so how this works is I'm going to start with my input image. Uh, apply a convolutional layer, apply max pool, apply another convolutional layer, apply max pool, apply three more convolutional layers, apply max pool, and then apply three uh, layers of feed forward. Okay, so in one line, I have um, AlexNet. Now, of course, I've underspecified um, a couple things here. One is um, 
I haven't specified uh, the parameters. Those are to be learned. And each of these uh, functions holds its uh, a private set of parameters that need to be learned. The second thing is I also haven't specified the hyperparameters, which is the number of channels, the filter sizes, and so on, which are actually pretty important for getting a good performance. But I just wanted to highlight the overarching structure and the idea that you can compose in a fairly uh, effortless way. So now let's turn our attention to natural language processing. So here's a motivating example. Um, suppose we want to build a question answering system. Uh, we have um, a paragraph, um, this is from Wikipedia. Uh, we have a question, and we want to select the answer from that passage, from the paragraph. So this is a, happens to be from um, the squad question answering benchmark. Um, so uh, let's just read this. So in meteorology, precipitation is any product of a condensation of atmosphere or water vapor that falls under gravity. And the question is, what causes precipitation to fall? Um, and the answer is gravity. So to do question answering, you have to do a fair amount of processing. Um, so you somehow have to relate the question with uh, the paragraph, but it's not exact match. Some of the words match like precipitation, but some of them are kind of more subtle, like causes is somehow related to product. And also the fact that some words are ambiguous, like product can mean um, or, um, multiplication or um, output. Um, so there's a lot of processing that needs to happen. Um, and it's hard to kind of uh, specify in advance. So, um, so first things first, so words are discrete objects and neural networks speak vectors. So whenever you're doing NLP with, um, with neural nets, you first have to embed um, the words or more generally tokens. Um, so we're gonna define an embed token function that takes a word or a token X and maps it into a vector. And all this function is going to do is it's going to look up vector in a dictionary that has a static uh, a set of vectors associated with particular tokens. So um, this is fine. And for if you have a, a, um, a sequence of words, then you can just embed each word into a vector to get a sequence of vectors. Um, there's one problem. Uh, which is that the meaning of the words and tokens depends on context. So this representation of the sentence is not going to be a particularly um, sophisticated one. So what we're going to do is going to uh, define an abstract function. Uh, borrowing uh, terminology for programming, abstract function is something that has an interface but not an implementation. Um, so a sequence model is going to be something that takes a, a sequence of input vectors and produces a corresponding sequence of output vectors where each vector in this uh, sequence is a process with respect to the other elements. So in other words, I want to contextualize these vectors um, using the sequence models. I'm going to talk about two implementations of the sequence models. One is recurrent neural networks, and one is uh, transformers. So historically, re recurrent neural networks have, have been around for, since you know, the early 90s, and uh, since uh, 2011 or so, it became really kind of the dominant paradigm for doing uh, deep learning NLP. Transformers uh, came out in 2017 and really has kind of uh, started uh, I guess, transform the landscape of deep learning and NLP. So an RNN or a recurrent network can be thought of as um, reading you know, a sentence left to right. That's a kind of intuitive way to think about it. So we have um, you know, a word which gets mapped into a, a vector um, that produces some hidden state. And then I'm going to read a second uh, input vector and I'm going to update this hidden state uh, with, along with this uh, thing that I just read into a new hidden state. And then I'm going to read another uh, input vector, updated state, and repeating again and again. Okay. 
So at the end of the day, I ask the sequence model because that maps um, an input sequence into an output sequence. And I notice that each vector here now depends on not just the, uh, um, the input uh, vector, but um, things to the left. So if you look at H3, H3 depends on X3, X2, and X1 to follow this computation graph. So the intuition, again, is reading left to right, updating hidden state as you go along. It's kind of like a memory. Um, one thing I haven't specified is what uh, this function that takes an old hidden state, an input, and updates the hidden state. So I'm going to do that next. There's two types of implementations I'm going to talk about. One is a simple RNN. Um, so the, the contract here is I'm going to have an old hidden state, um, an input, and we're going to want to generate a new hidden state of the same dimensionality. And the way a simple RNN works is it's uh, I take the hidden state, multiply by a matrix, um, take the input, um, multiply by a matrix, and I add these two, and I apply an activation function. So it's uh, fairly simple. And uh, one other way to think about this is that this is really the feedforward function applied to concatenation of H and X. Okay, so one problem with the simple RNN is that um, it suffers from the vanishing gradient problem. Um, if you have long sequences, then uh, the gradients start you know, vanishing. So LSTMs, or long uh, short-term memory, were developed to solve this problem. And the way that this works is uh, the interface is the same, and um, the implementation is some rather uh, involved thing that I'm not going to explain. Um, but intuitively, you should black box this and think about LSTMs as just a way to update the hidden state uh, given a new input, but without forgetting the past. Um, remember up here for that simple RNN, we can think about this as feed forward on X and H, which are treated kind of uh, equally. LSTMs kind of privilege H and make sure that H doesn't get forgot while going through this arrow. Okay, so now we have um, our sequence model on RNN, which uh, produces a, a sequence of vectors, which, and the number of vectors depends on how long the input sequence is. So suppose we want to do classification, we need to somehow collapse that into a single vector. So I'm going to define this function collapse, which takes a sequence of vectors and returns a single vector. So you can intuitively think about this as summarizing the collection of vectors as one. So there's uh, three um, common things you can do. You can just simply take the first vector, you can take the last vector, or you can take uh, the average of uh, all these vectors. So if you're doing text classification, you probably want to pick the average to not privilege any individual word. But as we'll see later, if you're trying to do language modeling, you want to take the last. So here is an example text classification model that we can uh, develop. Um, the score um, for, let's say, binary classification is going to be equal to uh, taking the input uh, sequence of tokens you embed all the tokens into a sequence of vectors, and now you can apply a sequence model, for example, the sequence RNN, um, and you can do this three times. That gives you um, depth, just like uh, we talked about for feed forward networks. And now you can collapse that into a single vector, take the dot product to get a number out. So this, um, these types of uh, functions that where the input and output have the same type signature are really handy because then you can compose them with each other and get uh, multiple steps of computation. So um, recurrent neural networks are uh, work generally fairly well, but um, they suffer from one problem is that they're fairly you know, local. And um, so, the one problem that, oh, so this is a problem that we're going to try to 
know, address with transformers. So uh, introducing transformers is fairly uh, involved. Um, so I'm going to step through, you know, introduce a, a few things before actually defining it. So the core part of a transformer is uh, the tension mechanism. And um, the intention mechanism it takes in a collection of vectors, um, of input vectors and a query vector, and then outputs a single vector. And intuitively, what the attention is doing is, is it's going to process y by comparing it to each of um, these x's. Okay. So uh, mathematically, what this is doing is um, you start with the query vector. I'm going to multiply a matrix to reduce its dimensionality, uh, in this case from six to three. Um, I'm also going to take um, the X tr uh, transpose, which is each row here is um, one of the input vectors, X1, X2, X3, X4. I'm going to reduce its dimensionality to also uh, uh, three dimensions. And now I can take the dot product uh, between these x's and y's. So that's going to give me a four-dimensional vector of, of dot products, intuitively measuring the uh, similarity between um, x and the x's and the y. So now I can take those scores and I can uh, turn them into probabilities by taking a softmax. So a softmax um, exponentiates the scores and uh, normalizes that into a probability distribution. So now I have a distribution over the input vectors, x1, x2, x3, x4. It's a four-dimensional vector. I can use that, those uh, probabilities, those weights, to, when I multiply by x, to take a weighted combination of the columns of x here. So uh, for intuition, if um, one of the and the inputs has a very high probability, let's say it's 0, 0, 1, 0, then I'm just going to um, pick out the third input vector. So in general, this is a distribution. So this is kind of like softly picking out um, which input vector is similar to y. OK, and then finally, I'm going to uh, reduce the dimensionality to some lower dimensional object. Um, so Similarity is, can be a multifaceted thing. So uh, one thing that um, the transformer does is allows us to use multiple attention heads. So I'm going to repeat this process again, um, taking the query vector, taking the input vector, comparing them, getting a distribution over the input vectors, and using that distribution to reweight the input vector. So I'm selecting out softly an input vector and I multiply a, a by matrix to reduce the dimensionality. I've done this twice, but in general, you can do this um, any you know, four, 16. So now I concatenate these vectors. So I have a four-dimensional vector from this computation, four-dimensional vector from this computation. I can concatenate them into a eight-dimensional vector. And now I can reduce the dimensionality back to the original uh, dimensionality that of the, of the input. OK, so that was a kind of very uh, involved uh, you know, process. But at the end of the day, you can think about this as taking y, comparing it with the x's, and selecting out the one that's uh, most similar, and uh, doing some dimensionality reduction in the process. OK, so that's attention. Um, the transformer. Uh, uses something called self-attention, which means that the query vector is actually going to be the input vectors themselves. So if attention, self-attention takes a sequence of uh, input vectors, um, and then it's going to output the same uh, a sequence of output vectors where the first vector is I'm going to stick x1 into the query vector for y and compute uh, the attention and then x2 and x3 and x4. So each of these vectors is uh, comparing a particular input vector with the rest of the input vectors and doing some processing. So in other words, I've basically uh, uh, generated a sequence of vectors where 
um, all of the objects, all n squared of the objects have allowed, uh, I've allowed them to communicate with each other directly. Um, so in contrast with RNN, um, we have representations that have to kind of proceed step by step. And the number of steps is the length of the sequence, which causes these long chains, which uh, prevents uh, kind of fast propagation, whereas attention um, solves uh, this problem. So one kind of slight uh, uh, you know, comment is that you know, I'm speaking very vaguely and intuitively about these things. Um, it's trying to provide as much intuition as possible. And I, it's really, you can't really be more precise because I'm, again, not specifying uh, the actual computation. I'm only specifying the kind of the scope of possible computations that um, can be done once um, the parameters are learned from data. OK, so that's the attention uh, mechanism. You can think about this as a sequence model that just takes uh, input sequence and uh, contextualizes the, uh, the input vectors into output vectors. So there's two other pieces uh, I need to talk about um, to, before I can fully define the transformer, layer normalization and residual connections. So these are really kind of technical devices to make the final uh, neural network easier to train. I'm going to package them up into something called add norm. And it also a, has a type signature of a sequence model where I have an input sequence of vectors and I spit out the corresponding set of contextualized vectors. And the intuition behind this is I'm going to apply f to x safely. So let me explain what that means. So add norm of f of x is equal to, I'm first going to take x and apply f to it. Okay, so why is that not good enough? Well, remember that um, in uh, these these functions are under specified. So at the beginning of training, they're basically not doing you know anything, and so they're basically kind of junk. And if this is junk, then anything that I build on top of it is also going to be uh, pretty junky. So what I want to do is add a residual connection. So residual connection is a kind of escape hatch that allows X to be propagated through a verbatim. So that means if F is junk, at least I have X. So then I'm going to add a, a layer norm function on top of this. Um, so layer normalization uh, is just a way to um, make sure that this vector is not too big or not too small because big vectors and small vectors um, result in uh, exploding gradients or vanishing gradients, which uh, stalls uh, training or makes training um, diverge. So specifically what layer norm does on a single vector is that it treats these as a set of elements and it subtracts the mean of those elements and divides by the standard deviation to kind of standardize the, the magnitude and of the vectors. Okay, so in summary, add norm of, with a particular function is just applying f to x uh, safely. Okay, so now I'm finally ready to define the, the transformer block. And this is again a sequence model that takes this uh, sequence of input vectors and spits out a contextualized set of output vectors. And this is just uh, intuitively processing each xi in uh, context. So there's only one line here. We've done actually a lot of most of the hard work. So the transformer block on a, a sequence of vectors is going to be x, and you apply a tension that allows all of the, the vectors to talk to each other. And then you uh, want to normalize to, and to do this safely. Um, and finally, you apply feed forward to each individual uh, resulting vector independently. And then you also want to normalize um, and do this safely. So, so that's it for um, a transformer block. So now I can, and now we have enough that we can actually build up to a bird, which was this really complicated thing that I mentioned at the beginning. The bird is this large unsupervised pre-trained model which is, uh, came out in 2018. 
which has really kind of transformed NLP. Before, there were a lot of specialized architectures for different tasks, but BERT was a single model architecture that uh, worked well across the many tasks. So this is the way um, it works for you know, uh, question answering. You take um, the uh, question, you concatenate it with uh, the paragraph, that gives you just a sequence of, of tokens. And uh, what BERT does on a sequence of tokens is it's, uh, it's going to embed the tokens. And then it's just going to apply the transformer block uh, 24 times. So again, the nice thing about having a transformer block that uh, where the input and output have the same dimensionality and type is that you can just kind of lay it on um, and get much deeper uh, networks. Okay, so at the end of the day, BERT gives you a sequence of, of vectors which are highly uh, contextualized and uh, nuanced and contains a lot of rich information about the sentence. Um, and from there, you can either use it to drive classification um, of, uh, let's say, binary classification uh, directly by collapsing the vectors into one vector, or you can use it to um, select out um, an answer to the question. Um, and I'm not going to go into details of how that works. So, so far we've talked about how to design functions that can process a sentence, a sequence of tokens or vectors, um, but we can also uh, generate new sequences. And the basic building block for generation is uh, I'm going to call it generate token. And it's, um, it's you take a vector, x, and you generate a token y. And this is going to be, this is kind of the reverse of embed token, which takes a token and gener uh, produces a, a vector. And the way generate token is going to work is that it's going to actually use this as a subroutine. It's going to look at all the possible candidate words that uh, one could generate. It's going to embed those to and take the dot product of x to get some sort of similarity between the vector and a potential candidate generation. So now we have some scores. We apply the softmax to get a distribution over possible words, and then we can generate from that probability distribution. So uh, here, building on top of generate token, we can do language modeling where the input is a sequence of words and the output is the next word. Um, so this is actually fairly simple since we already have all the essentially all the tools. So language modeling of, of X is you take X, you embed them into tokens. The crucial step is that you stick it through a sequence model. Remember, a sequence model um, does fancy stuff and it turns this sequence of um, kind of primitive vectors into contextualized vectors, which are um, have contained more information, and then it collapses them. And this time, you, you generally want to use the, uh, the last vector because uh, that's closest to the word that you want to generate next. And then that gives you just one vector, and you can use that to generate a, a token. OK, so finally, um, we can take language models and we can build on top of them um, to create what is known as a sequence to sequence model. So this is perhaps uh, one of my kind of favorite uh, interfaces because it's so versatile. So the basic idea is that you have an input, which is a sequence, and uh, you are trying to generate another sequence, which is the output. And sequences are very you know, general. You can use sequences to encode basically any sort of uh, discrete um, output. And the way we're going to do that is just using you know, a language model. So um, remember, a language model takes the sequence and predicts the next uh, token. So I can take start out with x, um, and I can use uh, query the language model to generate the next token. And then I can feed this token, attach this token to the history, query the language model again to generate the next token, and so on and so forth until I'm, I'm done. 
Um, so this is by and large how a lot of the state of the art um, methods for, for example, you know, machine translation works for generating uh, a translated sentence given an input sentence or document um, summarization or semantic parsing. Um, each of these are sequence can be framed as sequence to sequence tasks um, based on usually these days, um, uh, basically BERT and transformers. Okay, so that was a really quick and high level whirlwind tour of different types of differentiable programs uh, from deep learning. So we started with, uh, now in, in hindsight, it seems kind of very simple feed forward uh, networks. Um, then we looked at images and looked at convolutional neural networks, which were built on conf layers and max pool layers, and also uh, feed forward. So the nice thing about packaging this in a module is that now this actually is used in transformers in the different uh, places as well. Um, for uh, text and sequences, um, we first have to embed them into a sequence of vectors. And then we have uh, kind of two choices. We can either uh, use uh, um, recurrent neural networks, or we can use um, transformers, which are based on attention. Um, we can use sequence models, collapse it into a vector to drive classification decisions, or we can use them to generate uh, new sequences as well. So there are many details that are glossed over. In particular, um, the, some of the architectures have been simplified, so I encourage you to consult the original source if you want the kind of the actual, um, uh, the, the full gory details. Another thing I haven't talked about is learning any of these models. Um, it's going to be using some variant of stochastic gradient descent, but there's often uh, various tricks that are needed to get it to work. But maybe the final thing I'll leave you with is the idea that um, all of these of differential programming, which is that all of these complex models are built out of uh, modules. And even if you kind of don't understand or I didn't explain uh, the details, I think it's really important to pay attention to the, the kind of the type signature of these um, of these functions, as well as with an intuitive idea of what each of these are doing. Okay, so that ends this module. Thanks for listening.